always getting like punched in the eye. I, I had my head split open from somebody hit me in the, in the head with a pipe and I had mm-hmm. to get like five staples so, and somebody headbutt me in the face. And so my buddy's just like, dude, what is going on? Like you're yeah. a, a martial artist. Like what's going on? And I'm just like, at that point I just lost it. Hey everybody, we are here with Sean the Beastman Anderson. How are you? I'm great, Jenny. Thanks. How Thanks. Are you? I'm great. I'm great. Thanks for being here. I love the outfit. You match perfectly. I love like the, is that like the um we call it like the 80s like rap? Oh yeah, hip hop. Yeah, I gotta give it out to hip hop. You know, got the old school Adidas look going on. I love that look. Thanks. I have like the same, you know what? I should wear that one day. I have a picture of says totally gonna date me, but I don't care. And I was like 14 wearing that my mom took it it's in one of my albums at home it's so funny and i just thought i was like so cool back then of course i was 14 and i'm in that and i'm like with one of my girlfriends and now they're like it's well they've always been in style but yeah you match perfectly what's not to love about a tracksuit right yeah and you wear a lot of them you're a trainer that's my uniform yeah 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 wear it every day nice puma adidas nike yeah lacoste just got a lacoste one oh those are nice you ever wear the hats uh, sometimes I'm not really a hat guy, but it's cold now, so I've been sporting the beanie and uh, got a couple of hats representing my jiu-jitsu clubs that I belong to. Nice. Yeah, it's cold. We're out here in Southern California. We're used to it being warm. You're not from here, though, right? Well, I was born in Salt Lake City, Utah. Okay, so cold. Yeah, cold, <laughs> but I lived in California most of my life, and mm-hmm. I spent the last 22 years in Santa Cruz, so it's a little chillier up there than yeah. it is here. But Yeah. Huh. Cool. So you are in recovery. Mm-hmm. You're also a trainer that's very respected in the community. Do you call it a trainer, coach? Like, what do you call it? Anything. It's I mean, okay. I'm an instructor. Um, instructor, yeah. yeah. High-level martial art instructor, um, coach, kickboxing coach, yeah. um, facilitator. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's take it back. Let's learn about you. I know a little bit about you, but not too much. Um, so you grew up in Utah. I was born in Utah, and so my father was an alcoholic. Uh, him and my mom got married because... Uh, in Utah, they're, you know, strong Mormon culture. So okay. I come from a long line of uh, Mormons. Okay. I'm not Mormon. But that's what happened with my mom and dad. They met each other. Uh, he knocked her up and they had to get married. And he was an alcoholic. And were they, they really young? or um, They were young, yes. I think she was like 19, 18 or 19 or okay. something. And then um, he was abusive, physically abusive mm. and um, just a hardcore alcoholic. So yeah. she left him when I was two. Mm-hmm. Met my stepdad, who was originally from Southern California. Okay. He was in Utah with his dad doing business. And they met, and then we migrated back to Southern California. So I spent actually my childhood here in Southern California. Okay. All over the place. My parents were struggling with drug addiction okay. uh, most most of my childhood, pretty mm-hmm. much all of my childhood. So we moved a lot. We lived in Long Beach, Bell Gardens, Bellflower, Norwalk, Riverside, Ontario, San Bernardino, wow. like you name it. All this yeah. area. Anaheim. We lived in motel rooms down in Anaheim. Mm -hmm. Um, So uh, we ended up moving to the Colorado River area um, when I was in high school, uh, ninth grade. Mm -hmm. My grandfather had bought some property out there. This was before it was the vacation destination that it is now. So Mm -hmm. uh, my parents kind of tagged along and we set up shop in the Colorado River area, Needles, California, um, Laughlin, Nevada, that area, Bullhead City. And so I moved there and went through high school and again, parents were struggling with drug addiction. Um, so we were homeless sometimes mm. and I was trying to still continue through high school. Uh, yeah. I almost dropped out my junior year. My junior year, I struggled a lot. That's when I started smoking weed okay. and, um, parents were out of the picture. They had moved and they were, you know, struggling, living yeah. out of a car, living out of shelters. Did you have siblings? I had two little brothers, okay. They're not little now, but they mm-hmm. were my little brothers back then. So they were living with the parents. And so I just started sleeping on friends' couches mm. and I did not drop out of school, uh, thankfully. Uh, but my junior year, I basically like failed almost every class. So my senior year, um, I ended up getting a job at the local church. Um, the church kind of adopted me and, um, a woman from the church, she adopted me and got the power of attorney and I had a stable place to finish wow, high school. That's amazing. So I ended up recovering the grades for June from my junior year. And then, um, getting on the honor roll and I, I finished strong. I was involved in the church. I just started training in martial arts at that time. And so I had some structure. That's amazing because what you're explaining with that childhood, a lot of people would not go in that direction at all. They would not 
you know, have the desire, the confidence, the will, the want to graduate high school and, and to do good and to, you know, be at a church. Like when you were really little, um, when did you realize like, Hey, this isn't normal. Like other kids aren't living the way we're living. Well, that's a good question. I mean, when I was little, I mean, I, I was, uh, we had periods of stability. So like it was always, if we were living with like a grand parent or a family member, we'd move in with them for a little bit and have some stability and then move out. So just by nature, I knew things were not normal for me because mm-hmm. I was always moving, always having to make friends. My, my habitat was always changing. Surroundings mm-hmm. always changing. So I learned how to get along with people. Yeah. And, um, I became like a people pleaser, you know, Got it. became like a class clown. Yeah. And kind of my personality developed that way. And no long-term friends, obviously that you were getting to know for years at a time at that age. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And actually, um, we were just, you know, we kind of had a cycle where we, my parents would get jobs, clean up, start doing good. We'd get a house and start, you know, doing normal things, living like a middle class, I guess. Yeah. And then they'd get into whatever they got into and Mm -hmm. it would unravel. And then Mm -hmm. all of a sudden, boom, we had to move. And so we put all the stuff in storage, move somewhere or live in a van or live in a car or go live with another family member or a friend Mm -hmm. and lose everything in storage Mm -hmm. and start from scratch somewhere else. And it was like that same cycle. Yeah. And was it ever talked about? Like, did you guys talk about, you know, the problems that were going on? Did they tell you like about the addiction, the drugs, the alcohol? Or? No, they didn't. We never talked about it. I just yeah. saw it and um, figured it out. <laughs> yeah. So like when we moved to the desert, I was, you know, a teenager at that time mm-hmm. in high school. And so things started making sense to me there. And so I really grabbed, I was parentified at that time. I started really taking charge over my brothers and watch. I was always watching them anyways, babysitting. While Thank the God parents for you. Were doing whatever. Yeah. Thank you. Um, but I, they were like my kids, my mm-hmm. two little brothers. And, um, and then at that time I started because I was working at the church and I started taking on responsibilities. Um, I confronted my, my mom a, a couple mm-hmm. times about meth. Uh, yeah. I would be, we lived in a little tiny trailer, um, in somebody's backyard. Mm-hmm. And, um, this is one time and I was cleaning up and I found a plate with all the meth and stuff on there. And so I set it out like a parent, you know, when my mom came home or whatever, I'm like, what's this? And then she tried denying it. And, uh, but she knew that I knew and I knew that she knew that I knew. Yeah. And we had that conversation and I don't remember exactly how it went, but um, I didn't approve of it. Mm-hmm. She was ashamed and they tried to hide it a little better, um, but they were on their own journey. You know what I mean? Uh, my mother passed away in 2010. Mm, my sorry. stepdad, um, he's now sober and, and healthy and doing great in Idaho. Nice. Um, but those times were tough and I remember praying that they would die. Mm. I, I hated, I hated my childhood. I hated my parents. I hated being poor. Yeah. Um, and in high school, there were some times that we lived by the river, um, because we had no place to stay. So we had a little tent trailer and we'd park it out wow. on an Indian reservation or far away from people next to the water. And I have to go take a bath in the river before mm. school. Wow. And we had soap that we'd picked up, uh, from the, the hotels. Cause we'd stay at the hotels that were like $15 a night mm. in, in Laughlin during the week. And so we'd go up there once or twice a week and take towels and soap and all that stuff. And then when we were out in the tent trailer, um, we were using the, the supplies we scored from the the hotel. And I just remember it sucked going to school and knowing that my clothes weren't clean and knowing that I took a bath in the river. Um, you could see some of my pictures in the yearbook and I just Mm -hmm. looked sad. Yeah. Like what were you doing with those emotions at the time? shoving them deep down inside (laughs) and taking care of your younger brothers yeah and so then when my parents ended up moving they went to apple valley and they were staying in a shelter living in the car and i was writing letters to my brothers and then um every once in a while they'd send a letter back and i still have some of those letters Mm. and uh it was always talking about jesus and talking about god and you know i was starting um my own spiritual journey Uh through the christian um denomination i was involved in and yeah, I mean that. So that was like my childhood, and mm. then um, and you started experimenting, like smoking weed as a teenager, and yeah. So I, I did in the beginning, and then when I wanted to clean up and kind of take charge over those last couple of years, um, I buckled down. I got really involved with the church. I started an internship at the Southern Baptist Church I was going to, and so I, I was on the payroll f- as a janitor and landscaper, and then I also had an internship. So I was spending all of my time after school. 
um, doing the physical work and then doing, I, I was studying like the Hebrew and Greek and wow. putting together sermons. That's and amazing. I was in charge of like um, the Bible club. I created a Bible club at school and I, I got involved with all the youth from the other churches and put together um, events, prayer rallies and you know wow. things like that. So I had a nice start to get into the ministry, which was my goal at mm -hmm. that point. And I had a really close relationship with God, a private, personal relationship. I was like all in. And I just spent lots of time in prayer and, and studying. And um, then I heard about the rainbow movement. I don't know if you ever heard about that. It's like a hippie underground society or culture. No. And uh, some of my friends were into that. It's like... Um, Kind of like Burning Man, but they have gatherings, a uh, national gathering every year. They'll okay. pick, pick Still, a, a national forest. Yep. Okay. Um, but they're international, and it's basically like... International. Yeah, it's, okay. it's like a bunch of hippies, mm -hmm. homeless people, um, people who choose to not be in society. Mm -hmm. And so they have this gathering once a year, and then, um, you know, it's drum circles, trade, LSD, mushrooms, DMT, weed, and it's just like a big psycho, uh, psychedelic counterculture mm -hmm. community. So um, I hitchhiked out of the desert. after I did graduate high school. I'll fast forward a little bit. Graduated yeah. high school. I was on the honor roll. That was all doing good. That woman I lived with who uh, adopted me and had power of attorney, um, we ended up having a sexual relationship. Oh, wow. And so... And she was obviously... She was like 36 okay, or yeah. 37. And were you still a minor at the time? I was this? like right before I turned 18. Yeah. And I don't talk about this too much because it's kind of like just forgotten or... I think it's good for people to hear this kind of stuff. Shut deep down, yeah. Um, so she... This was a tripped out story. Um, she got involved with the church and started... Uh, she did like a presentation for the youth group. And she, this was like the tail end of the satanic panic that was happening. I don't mm -hmm. know if you know about that one. Everybody I, was blaming everything on satanic yeah, cults. Yeah, I remember that. So she came to the church and had a, uh, she got the green light from the administration to share this message. And basically her story was she was a member of a satanic cult, a generational satanic cult. And her parents um, victimized her with ritual abuse and satanic abuse. And, and was this true? Uh, mm. Well, or at least it's what she was saying. From everything I know, I, I as fantastic as the story is and as uh, crazy as the whole satanic panic thing got out and everybody was jumping on that, I think it's true because I met the investigator who helped her, the private investigator. Oh, wow. His name was Sai Lee, S Y, mm. and last name L E E. And um, he was a private investigator who specialized in satanic crimes and ritual wow. abuse. So I met him and he validated her story and she said she escaped from this uh, family that was like, a, you know, in a secret cult. The high level community members were in it and she ended up escaping. She's, she was from Ohio. And um, so anyways, that's how she was introduced to me through the church. And then mm -hmm. uh, she was always around and then she wanted to help me out because she kind of knew everybody in the church knew my story. My parents were gone and I was... Um, being helped by families at the church at this point. Yeah. So she adopted me and then uh, got me my own room and a bed and clothes. And I felt like a normal teenager. And then that's the environment I had to finish my last year and make up for all that failure from the junior year. Yeah. Um, and then she was into martial arts. That's how I got started in martial arts. Okay. I was like 16 at this time, 16 and a half or something. And so I, I started my martial art journey at that time. I uh, structure, I was working at the church, working with the church um, but then we went on, uh, my graduation, we went to the Virgin Islands and the sexual activity began there. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as a young man, I was, I was stoked, you know, yeah, of course, right. <laughs> I'm like, you at know, the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but in her mind, she was grooming me f to be a potential husband. I didn't know about this until like, she started saying things afterwards. And, oh, wow. And so it was like a plan all along kind of thing. Or? I don't know if it was, or if it just turned into that, but mm -hmm. she definitely had like idealizations of having a long-term wow. partnership with me. And so because I graduated high school and I started to kind of, you know, I, I was done with school yeah. and, um, I was 18 uh, and you know, this was after the Caribbean and everything. Yeah. I started to kind of do what young men do and started going hanging out with my buddy. We started smoking cigarettes and smoking weed and I'd come back home and she would smell that on me and all hell would break loose. And then she set up a meeting with the pastor to talk about my responsibilities living there because it was weird. It was like I was an adult, so I was supposed to be responsible. But at the mm -hmm. same time, she was treating me like her mm -hmm. adopted son. Yeah. And so we went to the pastor and she, 
basically she set up this meeting to set all the parameters and boundaries about if you're going to live in the house, these are the rules. And, um, she didn't tell the pastor about the sex, you know, of course not. <laughs> um, so basically at the end of that meeting, he said, well, it looks like these are the rules and you can either follow the rules or leave. And I was like, okay, well I'll leave. And, and that was like, can't smoke weed and yeah, and, and, and curfew, all that yeah, 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 basic stuff like that, which was understandable. Mm -hmm. But I also had all this undercurrent of her wanting to latch on more yeah, and more and more control. Yeah, it's got to be super confusing. And being eighteen, it's like I want less yeah. control, and I right. want to start going out and doing yeah. whatever. Not that that was good or bad or anything, but that's just how it is. Yeah. So I ended up moving out, moving into my buddy's house. Um, he had an old Winnebago broken down in the in his yard, so we turned that into our our bachelor pad. We ran a court out there, and we just had our own little hippie uh bachelor pad and uh -huh. um basically i'll fast forward i hitchhiked out of the desert and, and i'm sorry but were you still doing all the church stuff during this time no i kind of i kind of stepped back from that because again i was 18 yeah i graduated high school so i was starting to distance myself got it from all of that structure yeah yeah and um just you know be like a pothead and smoke yeah. and go and hang out yeah and um because of that decision for me to move out, that mm -hmm. investigator, here's another thing I forgot. I was working on this internship so that I could get a scholarship to go to Grand Canyon University, which was a Southern Baptist accredited Bible school, basically in Arizona. And I was going to get a, an administration of justice degree to work and be a, a mentored by that investigator. Okay. And so when I moved out and I started um, smoking weed, the word got out to him from her and then he accused me of being a Satanist and doing witchcraft. Oh, my God. And so I don't know Jesus. if they, they tried to get, like, an intervention going on, but I just said, to hell with it. I'm bouncing. And yeah. I, I hitchhiked up to um, Chico. Okay. And in Chico, I was staying with some high school friends who'd moved up there. And um, I took some cash up there. They didn't have any money. They were, you know... Kid, college age kids working at a fast food place. Right. Basically, there was four or five of us living in this apartment. I went up there, spent all my money, bought weed, bought alcohol, bought cigarettes, and then when the money was gone, it you know nobody was being friendly anymore. Yeah. And so then, I ended up getting a job, and um, one of my rainbow buddies hitchhiked into town. He heard I was there. He found me, and he was like, "Let's go hitchhike." And mm -hmm. I was like, "All right." So I got my paycheck, got my guitar out of pawn shop, paid them the rent. And I had enough money to buy some weed. And we hit the road with my guitar, a sleeping bag, and a backpack. And wow. we, we went up to Oregon. And at this point, I'm trying to grow my dreadlocks and uh, <laughs> and go to, you know. We need a picture of that. <laughs> I, ha I have <laughs> We got to put it up on they the They were screen. hard to find, but I finally got them. <laughs> okay. Nobody believes it. Um, but I went up to um, Eugene, Oregon, and I hung out around there. And mm -hmm. then the Rainbow Gathering was coming to Oregon at that time because that's where the um, the gathering is what it's called, was happening, Ochoa National forest up in uh, Eugene, Oregon area. So all of these hippies came from all over the place and mm -hmm. we're all staying at this state park mm -hmm. camp, like a campground. I actually know where that is. Oh, do you? Yeah. The, the hot springs? I've, I've been out there. Yeah. It's, I forget <laughs> the name of the hot springs. Cougar hot springs. I've been there once. Yeah. yeah. So this was before it was, I think now it's, it's all developed and yeah. stuff, but up there back in those days, it was like a spring that came out of the, the rocks and there was three little pools and okay. you know, you hung out in there. <laughs> yeah. So we hung out in Cougar Hot Springs and I was doing a bunch of LSD and mm -hmm. smoking weed and meeting convicts and playing guitar and learning how to pick up cigarettes off the street and, you know, mm. pour out the used tobacco and yeah. roll your own. And uh, so that that was my hippie phase. Mm -hmm. And then um, did you have any communication with your mom? And no. So I ended up um, going on a crazy bender where I got super drunk, super high, super high on LSD. And I just was like, OK, I got to leave. So in the middle of the night, it was raining. I'm up there in Cougar National or Cougar Hot Springs in the middle of the forest in Eugene. And I literally just start hitchhiking like in the middle of the night. It's pouring wow. rain. And you got picked up? Somebody picked me up. Yeah. And it was <laughs> this guy. He must have been drunk, too, because I was on drugs at this time. And the yeah. stuff that this guy was saying and as fast as he was driving was insane. But he drove me wow. somewhere down the mountain. He dropped me off. I, I go to like one of those totem pole mm -hmm. parks where you pull off and look at planters and I, I don't know the mountain yeah there's like santa stuff up there and i don't know it's hard to explain okay but i ended up getting dropped off i slept in an outhouse that night to stay wow. out of the rain and i was like i got to go home and see my brothers because mm -hmm. i just felt like i needed to see my brothers so i start the trek back home hitchhike home and then i see my mom and i look mm -hmm. like 
you know, I was sun baked and skin looking all tore up and raggedy hair was all jacked up. I probably, I was emaciated. Um, but my parents were happy to see me. I saw my brothers and then I stayed back in that desert area and I connected with my first ex-wife who was my high school sweetheart at that time. And we had dated before I left. And now that I was back, we reconnected. She had her own issues, um, still does have her own issues. God bless her. Mm. Um, but we decided to get together at that point. And so we lived with each other. We bought a van. We traveled to the United States. And uh, the van broke down several times. It ended up breaking down in Santa Cruz, mm. California. So it was her and I in this van, dreadlocks, broken down in Santa Cruz. And one of my buddies, the reason we went to Santa Cruz is because I had a hippie buddy from the Rainbow Group who was in Santa Cruz. And I had hitchhiked to Santa Cruz and found him. Um, just hanging out on the streets, went back. Um, and then later after we had the van and we traveled to the United States, we went back to Santa Cruz, found our buddy. He was involved in a ministry mm. up there and he had given his life to the the Lord, but he was still all hippied out. So we kind of united with him in his uh, Jamaican Pentecostal church. Okay. <laughs> and this was where it got crazy. Cause this, it, went, it sounds like a movie. You, you <laughs> it went from Southern Baptist, like. <laughs> like conservative Christianity to like hardcore Pentecostal, Holy ghost, praying wow. in tongues. And you were doing that. You got into that. I got into that. So wow. I cut my dreadlocks. I got a job at the grocery store mm-hmm. and I was fully into this ministry and not doing drugs at this time. No, obviously. No. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had done a prayer and fasting up in the mountains of Santa mm. Cruz for like three days. Um, I had no desire to smoke after that. Um, Experienced some pretty phenomenal experiences during that three days of fasting. Yeah, I bet. Um, But anyways, I I set my life to do the ministry and work at the grocery store to make the money, and Mm -hmm. I was going to go full into this ministry. And during that time, uh, now we're in Santa Cruz. We're in like um, maybe 2000, well, this was maybe 1998 is when I moved to Santa Cruz. 1996, I graduated. 98, I was in Santa Cruz. Um, I had kids with my first ex-wife, four kids, three daughters and a son. Um, and Four kids? Four kids. Wow. And she, she worked before she had the kids, and then after she had the kids, she, she wasn't working. And then um, I decided to go into management um, to make more money. And, oh, yeah, here's another part. So before I went into management, the, the Jamaican church said, hey, we're all moving to Florida because we had a television program on TV, community television. Mm -hmm. We were evangelizing on the streets and preaching and doing events. And um, I started to develop my personality within that um, environment. So I I had done evangelism. Um, I was working as a pastor for this church. Um, Were you really believing all of it or at the time? I mean, now that you look back, or was it more like a sense of belonging because of your life up until then? I think it was both. I mean, I totally believed in God because of my own, my own experiences, Mm -hmm. but the views that they were espousing were like super hardcore. And I started to feel like, okay, this is very cultish, very Mm -hmm. controlling. And we it got to the point where it's like Ninja Turtles are evil because they represent a demonic spirit. Troll dolls represent a demonic spirit. So there's demons (laughs) attached to everything. Somebody gets sick. It's like, okay, you must've done something wrong. Mm. Uh, There's sin in your life, you know, and like uh, everything, it was hardcore preaching against everything, homosexuality. And yeah. it was just, it was just hard. It was like the far right. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And so they were like, all right, we're moving to, um, um, Florida because the television program is, that we're creating here is going to Jamaica. People love it. We're going to get closer to Jamaica. So let's go. All right, cool. So I put in the two weeks for work, told the landlord, canceled the insurance, bought the plane ticket and then I just, I still didn't feel right about it. It was scary, you know, moving the whole family. So then um, I stayed up all night praying about it, you know, mm-hmm. like made an event out of it, like just stayed up all night praying, 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 praying. And then I just felt like I wasn't going to go. So mm. I, to me at that time, that was a huge deal. I had to break the news to these people, which I was like a lieutenant in their power structure. Wow. And we had so many things together that we had done Mm -hmm. and now I'm breaking away. So it was kind of a divorce in that way. Yeah. And Um, what was that feeling that you were feeling that made you go, nah, we're not going to do this. Um, just that they were very extreme and Mm -hmm. I didn't want to get pulled to a faraway environment with like these extreme beliefs. And then at that time, um, my first wife, she was, she was up and down. So she was having 
like major episodes. I don't even know how to describe it, but like bipolar mm. tantrums, huge tantrums, like manic highs and lows. Yeah. And yeah. so like out of nowhere, something would go down and it was like, okay, well, we're supposed to go here with them and do this ministry. And then I've got to work, but she's having like a full on tantrum and throwing Oof. things and breaking things, which doesn't fit with our lifestyle of being like Christians. So the, of course, everybody's saying that's demonic activity. So mm. then we had like exorcism type oh, wow. prayer meetings with her Sounds like utter chaos. Oh, it was just, it was insane. So then yeah. that group moved. Mm -hmm. We found a new church that was less crazy, but mm -hmm. still like Pentecostal. And uh, we joined that church family and all the dynamics that go with that. And um, basically she's still doing these, um, these, what you call them, you know, these manic highs, highs and highs lows. lows. And it's just not fitting with the lifestyle that we're talking about. And so, like I had said, we need to get counseling. We need to, we, first we talked to the pastor. We did counseling with the pastor. Mm -hmm. And then she was saying one thing and portraying it as one way. And then it was different. Right. So then I was like, we need to go to like a, a real counselor, you know, mm -hmm. not that they're not real counselors. But so a buddy of mine had a counselor and him and his wife had issues. So we went to that counselor. And again, it's like I'm bringing everything to the table. And then she's kind of like picking and choosing what she wants to say yeah and then i i end up um just getting kicked in the nuts every time i go to this mm. therapist and i'm paying and she's you know manipulating it the way uh that she wants and yeah. i'm just like i'm not gonna pay for this anymore so yeah. i started going to my own private therapist and i started telling her some of the issues and she was like you're in a like a majorly dysfunctional situation yeah and at this point i have to say because i didn't i haven't told anybody but it was getting physical like mm. um She's throwing stuff. She's breaking stuff. She's preventing me from leaving the house. She's blocking the doors. Yeah. Um, and the kids are there. Yeah, the kids yeah. are there. I don't want to do that in front of the kids. Mm -hmm. You know, she's yelling, screaming at the top of her lungs, taking things, throwing them like dishes out of the cupboards onto the floor, taking games and like games that you play with your friends, mm -hmm. dumping them out with all the stuff all over the floor and telling the kids to, you know. Yeah. Mess Mental around. health issues. Big time totally. So like, yeah. I ended up having to make the decision with prayer and thought and it wasn't mm -hmm. like a light decision right um, i got married because i wanted to be married and i wanted to be a husband and i wanted to be a father um but now i'm in the situation that i can't control and i don't know what to do and i'm doing the best that i can and so anyways the advice i got was divorce and so you know i'm like okay well trying to not do that as much as possible but at the end of the day it was either i need to do this or i'm going to end up in prison for yeah like, you know Beating right. her or yeah. something, you know, because, I mean, she was getting to the point where she's scratching me, spitting on me. I'd call the cops. I'd call the cops probably 15 and times. They, and they would come. <laughs> and at one point, they looked at me and they're like, dude, you got to get your shit together. We can't keep coming out here. And I'm like, mm. dude, I'm trying to not go to prison, <laughs> like, yeah. for defending myself against yeah. somebody who is hitting me, knowing that I could hurt them, you know. So anyways, push come to shove. I, I filed for divorce. Um, I didn't have money for an attorney, so I did everything through the court um, on my own didn't do it correctly. Um, I did not get the kids. I filed for full custody. State of California just gave her the kids, gave me the bill and they put me in debt $15,000. Wow. And, and they were like, okay, you got to pay like, it was like 1800 a month for, yeah. for the kids plus that $15,000 in debt. And so by the time my taxes, insurance and everything's coming out, I'm, I'm getting, making like 150 bucks a week. And at that point I was devastated. And I thought to myself, well, that's what I get for following God, you know, mm -hmm. like God's not paying my bills. The church people now, they all think I've abandoned my wife and I'm a deadbeat. And she's, of course, telling them my husband abandoned me. He left yeah. me with the kids. But the reality was I was trying to get out of a dysfunctional situation and take the kids with me. Mm -hmm. I had no, no um, arrest, no warrants. I had no um, nothing saying I was a bad person or yeah. father. Um, but because I didn't have a lawyer, I didn't have representation. I think it was just like, oh, okay, she gets the kids, stamp it, and yeah. set him up to pay. And I think it's so good for people to hear about this stuff, especially coming from a man's point of view, because this happens so often. I talk about it. I had a similar situation, um, and I've talked to so many people that I've been on here, and just people I know that have been through these situations with the family court system, and it's like you're guilty until proven innocent, and what you have to go through, and like essentially, you know, getting the bad rap, losing your kids for a period of time. And I think it's really good for people to hear that. So I'm glad you're talking about that and that, you know, in the end, obviously you overcame it, but I just wanted to say that. So, yeah, no, I appreciate that. And yeah. I mean, this is a real thing. Yeah, like I is. felt like the whole world was against me. Mm -hmm. My friends saw this happen and, yeah. and everybody's like, dude, no way. You know? And I'm like, 
So here I am. I'm trying to leave a dysfunctional situation. Yeah. I want my kids. Yeah, trying to do better. <laughs> right. And they gave her the kids and they told me, you could see them on these days. And she's mm -hmm. like, no, you could see them anytime you want. Well, it's locked in to see them on these days because I'm paying this amount of money. Yeah. So let's do 50-50. Yeah. And you pay for them when you have them. I'll pay for them when I have them. And I get to do what I want with them when I have them because I have the money to do mm -hmm. things with them. That's not how it worked out. Mm -hmm. And so everything was on her terms. She was the power broker in the situation. And um, I had to work to get out of debt. Like I needed to work to survive. So I needed to pick up side work, which means mm -hmm. I don't have any extra time. Yeah. So I ended up working in martial arts. Um, mm -hmm. I ended up working as an instructor just to pay to cover the cost for the kids to do the martial arts for kids at, you know, 150, 200 bucks a pop. Yeah. So I start. that's when I got, got into teaching martial okay. arts and eventually the kids got bored of it, but that's how I supplemented my income to pay off that $15,000 because that $15,000 in debt every year they're sending you a thing automatically if you don't pay this down we're going to take your driver's license we're right. going to take your passport you're going to do jail time but mm -hmm. you just feel pressure from every angle it's like yeah. i am paying I, I i'm the one who told the judge uh start garnishing my wages so that mm -hmm. she gets the money and i don't have to go through her i had no idea what i was doing to myself but yeah the, i remember the look on everybody's face they're like are you serious you know but i was thinking yeah i'm serious because i i don't want to have to go through her because she's not giving me receipts mm -hmm. um because all that time and until like we went to court i was paying for things and she just wasn't giving me receipts yeah. so when we went to court they're like oh how long have you guys been separated we're going to backdate it to that time and now you owe the fifteen thousand. yeah and so anyways to make a long story short that that kind of like ruined me financially yeah and so now i'm just working my butt off so that i can pay rent mm -hmm. for the apartment that I had to pay for to get out of that dysfunctional situation. Mm -hmm. But now all my money is getting taken for the kids, yeah. which I don't mind paying for the kids. I love my kids. I'll support my kids. So I, I'm, meanwhile, I'm dealing with this monster, this financial monster. Mm -hmm. um, and time, like I have to give up my time for money. I got to pay the money because mm -hmm. there's these bills. And then um, I'm not able as a result to spend as much time with the kids because yeah. it's either money or time. Um, and eventually I, uh, started to equalize that out and I met my second wife, um, through work. I had mm -hmm. worked with her several years and we knew each other. We were not involved romantically before mm -hmm. we were both separated, um, but because we knew each other and she was going through her divorce, um, I, we ended up becoming close and yeah. I was telling her my story. Yeah. We ended up, um, getting married ourselves mm -hmm. at this point. I'm like, I don't believe in God. I don't care about God. God mm -hmm. didn't help me out. It's a sham. Um, yeah. I got, and were you sober during this time? Um, this is when I became not sober. Okay. I was sober up until then. But back up for one sec. So that whole situation that you went through, you did that sober. Yeah. What would you tell men and women out there that are going through that situation? Like, how did you find the strength to get through that sober? Like, what was your thought process and what was your routine like that you're able to get over that? Well, I had built my lifestyle through my religion. So mm -hmm. like staying involved in the church and preaching mm -hmm. and reading and praying and everything was central of, around God and religion. So okay. there was no pattern of behavior or like I didn't have that as part of my toolbox, mm -hmm. drinking or drug. I yeah. had given all that up when I like cut my dreadlocks, got yeah. a job. It was like, okay, I'm going to do 100% ministry. Mm -hmm. And then after that group left... Now I did. I wasn't like accountable to anybody. I wasn't living yeah. that lifestyle. And then we still had this other church we were going to, but now I wasn't like involved. Got so it. then I started like I started buying four packs of Guinness. Uh -huh. That's kind of what I started in drinking at night. Yeah, one beer with dinner. It wasn't like it wasn't a habit or an issue at this yeah. at this point. And then um, as I moved out of that, I'm trying to think if uh, the drinking really picked up during that first divorce. I don't think so. I think I was running on the beach and I wasn't eating because of the stress and I was just working. I was working and, and trying to stay healthy and keep yeah. my mind off of everything. And then in that lifestyle, I started to talk to my the second right. wife. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. And my frame of thought in that next one was the spiritual me that I've like has been me is now deep down inside. I'm just going to be a normal person. Mm. That's the thing I told myself. Like, mm -hmm. I'm, what is normal? We don't know. But right. to me at that point, normal was smoking weed, smoking cigarettes, drinking, going to work, going out, dancing, 
like just don't be a religious freak basically yeah. and nothing what no- too extreme yeah yeah exactly what do normal people do well everybody's drinking any party i got involved uh, invited to while i was in the ministry or not in the ministry people are drinking yeah. it's like mm-hmm. normal social yeah so i started drinking during that time okay. frame, really and it became what i thought was normal i didn't know what i know now about alcohol right specifically alcohol progressive and, drugs, <laughs> and, and, and what it does to the brain yeah and what it does mm-hmm. chemically yeah. Rewires you. Mm-hmm. And so during this time, I'm starting to develop the drinking habit. Mm-hmm. I get, uh, so now life is stabilized a little bit. Now I have a system. I see the kids on the weekends. Yeah. And if I can get them during the week to go to the martial arts, we're doing that. They're growing bigger. They're starting to do things on the weekends with their friends. So I might pick up three of them this weekend, maybe two of them that next weekend, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm starting to drink more and more on the weekends. And actually, anytime I'm not working, you're, you're going to see me drinking. And was your wife doing the same or? Um, she, no, she could drink a Corona for like six hours, one, oh. one beer. And I'm like, man, I wish I could do that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm like, what is going on? And then whenever she'd get upset because I'm buzzed or slurring, I'm like, well, you don't drink. So you're just mad because I'm buzzing or I'm, you know, yeah. I'm drunk or whatever. You have been sipping on that Corona for like six hours. Yeah. You know, like that's not your thing. That's yeah. cool. But yeah. it's my thing, and I'm yeah. not, I don't have a problem. All my friends are like, "No, you don't have a problem, do you? You just drink," you know. Mm-hmm. And so it got worse and worse and worse. And then um, I hurt my back, so I went to the doctor, and he, he gave me a prescription of Norco's. Mm. And so yeah. then I'm like, "Whoa!" That's what I was taking too. The Norco's, really? yeah. Uh-huh. And then uh, the back pain ended up going away, but I like those Norco's. Yeah. So when it was time to go back to the doctor, I'm like, "Yeah, it still hurts." Mm-hmm. I did that for three years. Mm-hmm. and it got to the point where I'm not leaving the house unless I have at least one pill with me, depending on what time of day it is, because yeah. I think I was taking three a day, one in the morning. One, I wasn't taking 12 or 13, but I was definitely doing the three a day. If I was off, maybe I'd pop one for fun, you mm-hmm. know, um, or if it was that nighttime and I'm going to chill out with my buddies and pop a couple or mm-hmm. something. And then guess what? I have to pay the price at the end of the 30 days and wait, <laughs> you know, wait for yeah. that doctor yeah. to fill the prescription. Finally, I went to the doctor I'm going to fast forward on this one for like three years. And my doctor was on vacation and his person covering him was like, how long you been doing this? And I was like, I don't know. She looked at the chart. She's like, Oh, you've been on this for like three years. If you keep this up, you're not going to see 60. Mm. And I'm like, what? And she's like, yeah, like you need to wean yourself off of these. And I had weaned myself off a few times just because I was out and I was waiting for that right. next one. I guess that's not weaning yourself off, but I'd stopped temporarily. And so at this point I was like, okay, I'm going to, have to do it. And so I weaned myself off of the Norcos the whole time I'm drinking. I was mm-hmm. drinking during all this time, smoking weed, making edibles. Um, and I hadn't gotten into the cocaine yet. <laughs> that's, mm-hmm. that's coming up towards the end. But thank God that doctor said something. Cause that's like such a classic tale. Like that was my situation too. All pharmaceutical prescribed, you know, that's how it all started. Yep. And the doctor would increase it, you know, and it was never like there was a problem. And I didn't hang out with drug addicts, so I didn't know. I was like, all right, this is just what I'm taking and they're increasing it and blah, blah, blah. But like that's such a slippery slope and that's how people end up then turning to heroin and all that stuff, you know, so. And you don't know how bad it is until you're trying to not Exactly it. until you, yeah, that's what and I had that the, was my the, story. The yeah. restless leg and like I couldn't sleep yep. and I had I had like diarrhea and I was mm-hmm. sweating. You and feel so out of it. It was it's horrible. Worst. But once yeah. it was over, yeah, I felt free. Clear. And I knew. Like nobody mm-hmm. else knew. Like even my wife didn't know how much I was taking these pills. Like, yeah. I kept it on the on the down low, mm-hmm. very discreet. And three years for sure, I was taking those pills. And um, of course, the, and now the whole time the drinking is escalating. And I started mm-hmm. making my own alcohol. I learned how to make moonshine. Okay. And <laughs> um, and I was making my own infused alcohols. And so I'm, I'm just doing it. I always had high high level alcohol, you know, top notch mm-hmm. stuff. I had a full bar. And I, now at this point, I'm drinking wine liberally. Mm-hmm. I'm drinking hard alcohol liberally. Beers, yeah. 12% IPAs liberally. And is it affecting your life now? Like your daily routine, you know, your quality of life at this point? I'm like a different breed. Mm-hmm. As most alcoholics will tell you, mm-hmm. uh, I can drink and drink and drink until I pass out and then get up and go to work. Got it. Uh, hung so over, you were like, quote unquote functioning. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And then what you know, it got worse. It got to the point where people were smelling it on me and seeing it on me. And it was like, it became my life. But yeah, um, this whole gradual thing, like it's like throwing that frog in the boiling water, you know, cold and you turn it on mm-hmm. and it slowly heats up and mm-hmm. it doesn't jump out. I don't yeah. even know if that's true, but it makes sense though. That's it's, how, yeah. It's a good it's analogy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so the, the drinking just kept getting worse and worse. I ended up getting off of the pills, but now I'm in this habit where I have to drink just because I drink. 
Yeah. And like, I'm feeling like crap in the morning. And now the good thing about the pills was I was able to take that pill first thing in the morning. It didn't make me feel hungover. Exactly. It would get me through the day. And then as soon as I get home, then I'm taking like yeah. three or four double shots of gray goose. Mm -hmm. And then I'm chasing that with the 12% IPA three, mm -hmm. you know, one after each double shot yeah. just to get going just to feel normal. And I still wasn't like on the verge of stumbling or passing out. And then it was like an hour and a half later, it would all hit me. Yeah. And then I'm stumbling and slurring and the wife is mad at me and she's mm -hmm. like, you're a freaking alcoholic. And then I'm getting defensive. Yeah. And, um, that took its course. And so, um, I was successful working in the grocery industry. I worked in the grocery industry for 22 years. I was a store director, assistant store director. I, I built stores from the ground up. I trained entire, uh, the entire workforce mm -hmm. for that store. You know, the night crew, the yeah. dairy people, the cashiers. And so I was respected, but now it's like creeping into my work mm -hmm. and uh, people can smell it on me. I'm sure there's mood changes. And know. are you just in denial? Like I'm good. Yeah. Well, you know, she's telling me I'm an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. She's the only one telling me I'm an alcoholic, mm -hmm. but I know the kids hate it when they come over, mm -hmm. you know, I'm drinking whenever yeah. we go somewhere, I'm drinking. I was definitely, um, not a stranger to drinking and driving and, yeah. um, go to the beach. We're drinking, you know, wake up in the morning. We're having a, you know, Irish coffee mm -hmm. or always a reason. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, the, uh, bloody Mary. And then for mm -hmm. lunch, we're going to have some wine with lunch. And then mm -hmm. for, and then we're going to have some uh, cocktails in the evening and then we're going to kick into some nighttime drinking mm -hmm. and make a long story short, it caught up with me. Um, I ended up paying all that child support and then, um, I was proud of that. And I took the paperwork into the Department of Child Support um, when it ended in 2008. And, oh, no, we got married in 2008. I think it ended in 2013. And I took that to them, and then a couple months went by. And then all of a sudden, their legal team looked at the, um, the termination of child support, and somebody in the notes who did the minutes didn't write it correctly, so technically they could legally say it goes on forever because the wording wasn't correct. So they said I owed the past six years of spousal and spousal indefinitely, even though we were married less than 10 years. So then they put me in debt, $40,000, and then they started garnishing my wages oh, again. Wow. And then, um, so I'm hobbled and crippled financially again. Um, I get into it with my wife and uh, her step, or my stepson, her son comes down and he gets into it with me. He pushes me. I tell him to keep his hands off me and um, he pushes me again and then I take him down because, you know, I do martial arts. So I took him down and I start smacking him in his mouth and I'm not justifying this. I just thought yeah. that's what you do mm -hmm. to a kid who's trying to be a man and you're his dad. And, you know, it's just like I, I thought that's what I should do is mm -hmm. smack him in his mouth, teach him a lesson. And uh, he freaks out. She freaks out. She starts calling the cops. I'm like, well, if you're calling the cops, you know, I'm going to make it worth my while. And I smacked him a couple more times. And in my mind, I'm not beating him or punching him or anything like that. I'm just smacking yeah. him. To me, at mm -hmm. that time, it, that's, it felt justified. Um, the cops come. I tell them what happened. Same thing I just said. They arrest me, and they want to put me in prison for nine years for, like, beating Whoa. a kid. He was under 18. So he was a couple weeks away from 16. And... Um, wow. they want to charge me with like, uh, I'm just, I don't remember the exact charges, but it was like beating a kid, um, kidnapping a kid, torturing and terrorizing a kid and all this stuff, like with intent to create great physical bodily harm. And, yeah. um, I ended up going to jail and like not even able to digest what's going on. I come yeah. out, um, How I, got long were you in for? Uh, I, I bailed out. Okay. Um, I was only in for like a night or whatever. And then I got an attorney. I got bailed out. And um, there was a um, restraining order. I wasn't allowed to see her or the house or like my whole this life is your, froze. Okay. Your present wife uh, and your. Not my present wife. At, uh, this time at the time. Frame, at the time. Yeah. yeah the was second my wife. second wife. Yeah. Yeah. And that was it your son or her son? It was her son. Her son. Okay. So you're not allowed back. Not allowed back at all. And so she's still talking to me. Mm -hmm. And she's like, hey, I the cops told me to do this. I have to do this. Um, the family, they're all upset, you know, but we're going to get through this and blah, blah, blah. And so her and I were still seeing each other mm -hmm. behind the scenes. And but I couldn't go to the house or be at the house. And, you know, um, 
that was pretty tough right there. Yeah. Um, because that interrupted my work schedule, it interrupted everything. And it was like, okay, now I'm financially hobbled. So my money's getting taken before I even get it into my bank account mm -hmm. with a bogus charge saying I owe my previous ex-wife for six years back spousal support. My current wife called the cops on me because I smacked my stepson and now I can't go back to the house. And then the other thing, oh yeah, uh, while I was out of the house and we're trying to negotiate that whole thing, um, still seeing each other. She's saying it's all going to work out. We just got to like, you know, figure it out. The family's pissed off. Uh, she ends up having an affair with somebody in a car. Like they picked her up and she went up and they had an affair. And the way I found out about it is she got an STD. And so she so shows up at my work with some pills and she's like, uh, you got to take these because I had a UTI and the doctor says, uh, you might get the UTI or something like that. And I'm like, uh, okay, it doesn't mm. make any sense. And, I was just bothering me all day long. And then finally I call her, uh, at the end of the day and I'm like, what is going on with these pills now? And then she, you know, um, she just breaks down, starts crying. And I, I knew it was not good. And then she tells me how she had this affair, unprotected sex with this guy. She ends up getting chlamydia hmm. and because she got it and she experienced the symptoms, the doctor said, do you know anybody else? Are you having sex yeah. with anybody else? And then, so as a uh, preemptive, they, they give me these things, which I never, I don't know that I ever had it or anything like that, but yeah. That was like the unholy trinity that just like mm -hmm. destroyed me. So we got the spousal support destroyed financially. I got the legal situation. I'm looking at like felony charge mm -hmm. and they're, they're telling me I'm a felon and um, I got to give up my firearms and I'm not going to be able to vote looking at prison for nine years. And then my wife cheated on me with our wedding ring on her finger, unprotected sex gets chlamydia. And I'm just like, just like, devastated yeah rock bottom rock bottom and yeah. so i'm sleeping at my buddy's house on his couch they're renting a room that's a whole family renting a room on hmm. on their own it's just like a bed and a couch and a tv in there uh, it's got you know two adults and a child and like cats and dogs in there and i'm sleeping on their couch still going to work mm -hmm. drinking when i get off and then um we meet a guy who's a cocaine dealer and he becomes our friend and so now it's like free cocaine anytime mm -hmm. i want good mm -hmm. cocaine so now I'm doing cocaine when I get off work, um, drinking, um, not eating. And then I'm drinking up until I pass out at two or three in the morning. And then I get up at five or six in the morning. I muscle through the day. And then it got to the point where I was doing the cocaine at work. I was mm. taking it and sneaking into the bathroom as the store director or assistant store director. I'm doing this. And then meanwhile, I'm on um, antidepressants. Oh. Because I went to the doctor because I was depressed. Recipe for disaster you got going on. And, you know, they have a side effect. Some, um, sometimes they make you more depressed. Yeah. Not to mention the cocaine and the drugs and the pills sure. and the, the weed and not eating. Um, those things are... This concoction that I'm taking is like... Has me so depressed from October, November, December of 2019. I could not stop thinking about ways to kill myself. Mm. I started breaking down on the sales floor in the check stand. Like I, I would have to go out to the back of behind the building and mm -hmm. I was just crying uncontrollably. And my HR person who was a friend of mine, um, she swings by the store and she's like, what is going on? Like this mm -hmm. is a, an unofficial visit. What's going on? Because I had this great reputation of being the guy who can get it done no matter what, yeah. you know, write good schedules, get profit. I, I can do it all. And now there's stories of me smelling like alcohol. My eyes are red. I'm unshaven. My clothes are, you know, looking frumpy. And I, I tell her, like, what's happening. Mm -hmm. And she just felt pitiful for me. And so she gives me the health, uh, mental health phone number mm -hmm. for the uh, you know, 1 800 number for counseling. I didn't even know what to do with that. And looking back, it's like she, was doing her best, but like, I still didn't have clear direction on where to go or what to do. Yeah. And I think I did make, I called the insurance and I got some random therapist. Mm -hmm. I went to that therapist. It was some dude like doing it out of his garage. Okay. And <laughs> not the, what you, not what you need. The whole the thing time. was a yeah. joke. I don't know how to find the right resources. Yeah. I don't have the time. I don't have, it's just a big mess. So I said to myself, I'm going to get through these holidays because it's all on me. Like, all these employees are looking to me, 178 employees, my district manager, customers. I'm going to get through the holidays, and then I'm just going to kill myself. 
Mm. And so I started thinking ways to do it. And I'm thinking, okay, I gotta drive my car off of the cliffs in Santa Cruz somewhere. So I spent one night driving to every spot I could think of. And there's these concrete barriers there. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm not going to do that. Uh, I'll get a tube and put it on my exhaust pipe and run it through my window and I'll just let the car idle. And then I was like, oh, I don't, I don't know if that'll work or if I can do that. And then I'm like, well, I'll get my gun. I had a, um, 45, but my buddy had it and he wouldn't give it to me because I just wanted to drive out in the woods and just put it in my mouth and, and blow my head off. And then, um, finally I was like, okay, I'll just do a bunch of drugs. So they had some pills of some mu muscle relaxers they, they had from Mexico or something. And I just took a bunch of those and I had a bunch of Ativan that my doctor had given me, took like 12 of those. And I drank out of a handle of, um, Hennessy and I'm just mm -hmm. going for it. Yeah. And in my way, I said my goodbyes to the people I was staying with. And then I remember just like melting onto the floor yeah, and feeling my consciousness fade away. And I was like, okay, this is it. This is it. And then I woke up at six with my alarm going off, completely disoriented and went to work. Mm. And I was, I worked that day completely out of my mind, like just barely keeping it together. And then, um, I was like, okay, well, that didn't work. Um, I'll just drive my car into something. Mm. So then I get through Halloween. I get through uh, Thanksgiving. These are all the hugest days of the year for the retail business. We get through uh, Christmas, and then finally we get through New Year's. Mm -hmm. So January 1st, it was on a Wednesday, I think. Thursday, I'm off. I'm like, okay, I'm going to ensure we get the all the holiday stuff off the sales floor so when the boss comes in in the morning, it looks like no holidays happened. And I'm done. I'm checking out from society. So um, after work, I was still in my white shirt and tie, slacks, loafers, drove mm -hmm. down to my buddies, uh, picked up the cocaine dealer we were all hanging out with. He had to work at 7-Eleven that night, the night shift. So I give him a ride to 7-Eleven. He's got Coke and he's got all the beer you want in the 7-Eleven. So I go get some high octane IPAs and I'm just doing Coke and drinking all night while he's working. For like eight hours, mm -hmm. homeless people are walking by. I jump out, I go hang out with them, buy them a sandwich, buy them a Gatorade, shoot the breeze for a second, tell them how I used to be on the street, <laughs> mm -hmm. and go back, get back in the car. And, um, anyways, <clears throat> some guy pulls up at like two or three in the morning and he gets out of his car, and I'm just chilling on the outside of my car in a 7 Eleven parking lot in Santa Cruz. I'm like, what's up? And he's just staring at me, I'm like, what's up, dude? And then he comes and gets in my face, he's like, you know, confronting me like don't talk to him if i got a problem and then he just like hits me and he knocks me straight on my ass it knocks my glasses off my face and then my buddy comes running out it's like hey, hey hey and that guy like gets in the car and drives away and then my buddy's asking me what's going on you can't be doing that here i'm gonna get in trouble i'm like dude i don't know he just like came out he hit me i don't know whatever yeah so we get back he he gets out of work we head over to pick up my other buddy who i was staying at his house and we're having some sushi at like 10 in the morning and the cocaine guy's telling my buddy about what happened. So then my buddy, this is the straw that broke the camel's back because at this point I've been involved in like a few altercations when I'm drunk or something. Always getting like punched in the eye. I, I had my head split open from somebody hit me in the, in the head with a pipe and I had mm -hmm. to get like five staples. So and somebody headbutt me in the face. And so my buddy's just like, dude, what is going on? Like you're yeah. a martial artist. Like what's going on? And I'm just like, at that point I just lost it. He said some other stuff too that was I felt was disrespectful or whatever. So I decided to uh, choke him in the middle of the sushi place. And um, I took off my shirt, started choking him. Just like my brother. He's like mm -hmm. letting me sleep on his couch. Mm. The only person on my side. And I just lose it. And I, I run in my car and I just start crying and I have no shirt on. I have my slacks on, my loafers. I get in my car and I just start driving. I'm headed south on the on the 101 or the highway one. And I'm going like 160 miles an hour. And I'm looking for something to drive into. Mm. And I'm saying my, goodbye, my goodbyes. And I have a life insurance policy at the time for like a million dollars or something. I'm thinking the kids will get that. Yeah. And that's all anybody wants at this point. They just want me for money. They just mm. want me for money or, you know, they want to put me in prison um, so I'm just going to end it. I can't figure it out. There's no way I can, I can do it. Um, I'll just end it. The kids will get the money. And so I'm looking for something to drive into. There's a big divider, so I can't cross into the other lane. So, um, I'm like, if I keep going this fast, the 
CHP is going to catch me at some point. So I pull off on a farm road in Salinas. I see this telephone pole down at the end, you know, like a mile or half a mile. And I just like put the pedal to the metal, 60 miles an hour. I just was getting closer and closer and closer. And I just drove straight into the telephone pole. Wow. And like, it's coming up, you know, like mm. in your vision. And I just freaking hit it. And, uh, the airbag exploded and the, um, it broke the telephone pole. The telephone pole came down. Um, and it's just this big explosion. It's, you know, the dust from that airbag, it's just yeah. like all happened so crazy. And then I'm just sitting there and the car's beeping and there's smoke coming out of the engine and there's dust everywhere. And I'm just like, and you're alive. I'm alive. And I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? Yeah. And I look at myself and I just had like a little, scratch on my arm from the airbag wow. hitting my forearm my head didn't hit anything I, di I didn't hit anything and what did you think in that very moment uh well now i hear sirens and well at some point i heard sirens and i'm like trying to get the car to go and it won't go it's done and i'm like dude this was like the last thing that i owned was my car i just paid it off this mm -hmm. is like the last thing that i have everything else is gone and now i'm in an accident i'm on cocaine i'm drunk and I just take off running across the field. It was in the farms in Salinas. So I just take off running with no shirt <laughs> mm. as far as I can. And I just lay down as I hear the sirens get closer. And I'm just like, I'm so pissed off. I'm like, I can't even freaking kill myself. Are you kidding me right now? I just made things like a million times worse. And I call my dad, uh, my stepdad, and I, I'm just crying. And like the worst you could think of. Like yeah. Biggest crybaby, loser, baby, like failure and then my dad just starts ripping me he's like dude your mom your mom would be so upset right now and then the cops come and the chp come and the fire department come and they saw a car that was they, they got a car for they got a call for an accident they see this car with like smoke coming out of it and flames and they think there's a dead body mm -hmm. they're looking for a body they don't see a body they're looking for like somebody who got thrown and then they see me with no shirt laying in the middle of these artichokes and they come up and I just start crying, you know, and I'm like, dude, and I'm wasting your guys' time, you know, like I just wanted to die. And, um, you told them that. Yeah. And the cop's like, what? And he gets down and I just vomited out yeah. like, what was going on. And we, they were the nicest, sweetest people I ever met. And I felt mm. so ashamed that they're wasting their time. And, uh, and do you think that was God? You know, when you look back, obviously, yeah, right? Yeah, I do. Yeah. yeah. So um, that cop said that at that time, the CHP. He was like, somebody didn't want you to die today. You know, he's going to be chipper. <laughs> he's like, this is a miracle. <laughs> and then we start walking back, and I, I, one of the CHP was, like, huge. He was, like, six foot four or something. Mm -hmm. I'm like, if I try to, like, do something, maybe that guy will shoot me. So then I start wow. going for him. And it was, like, a joke because, you know, I'm <laughs> five foot six or whatever. And so they just hold me back and they're just like, they saw it, they saw it for what it was. And so anyways, the CHP officer, he rode with me in the ambulance mm -hmm. and he was just there holding my hand and he just told me, God has a plan for you. Mm. And he was just saying nice things to me yeah. like as a person. And you weren't I, used to that just authentic kindness. No way. Not you for know, a while and, and anyways, Especially huh? with the police, you yeah. know, and like the police are the enemy. And especially in this situation, because the funny part is those cops who came, I used to party with their boss, the oh, cops wow. who came uh, when I when I assaulted my stepson. Uh -huh. And I'm like, call Henry. You know, how do you know Henry? Henry's like a family friend. Call him and let him know whose house you're at. You know, and I was thinking I'd get some type of break or mm -hmm. somebody would know what the situation was and not yeah. portrayed in a different situation. And it just got portrayed. It, it's a bad situation, but it got like taken to be the absolute worst you could think of. Mm. And so um, I, I end up going to the ER and he's with me for like four hours. I'm detoxing. They got IVs in me. They're doing blood tests and they're telling me, oh, your wife's here now. Um, you've got cocaine in your system. I blew like a 0.3 or something like that. Jeez. Yeah. And I didn't want her to know about the cocaine, you mm -hmm. know, uh, the ex-wife. And um, so anyways, I go 5150. I'm in there for like 12 or 13 days. And, and just for anyone that doesn't know what that is, that's a hold, right? Yeah. Psychiatric yeah. Um, valuation for yeah. those three days. Yeah. Because I had tried to kill myself. Yeah. So they put me in there mm -hmm. and then, um, you know, they're stabilizing me. I'm withdrawing from alcohol and yeah. which I'm doing every single day. 
my yeah. body's now. What's that conversation like with yourself while you're sitting on that 5150? Um, well, number one, like the nurses and everybody was like really nice and they were, they were just like making it a point to come over and check on me. And, you know, they were, everybody was trying to make sure I wasn't going to try to kill myself <laughs> on their watch, you know, yeah. but at the same point, I'm like, why do you guys even care? Like, mm. you know, like there was a couple people that really tried to make an effort to connect and cheer mm-hmm. me up. And I'm like, you guys don't even know who I am. And like, I'm not going to tell you the story, but like, why do you even care? I couldn't understand why another person could care so much about somebody that they they don't even know Mm -hmm. and so that kind of blew me away and then I'm just like okay my thought was I'm gonna I'll be the man of my word I'm not gonna try anything here but as soon as I'm out I'm gonna jump in front of a bus or I'm gonna do something Mm -hmm. I'm gonna make it work next time so um I ended up uh getting released on the condition that I find a dual diagnosis um Mm -hmm. recovery center for mental health and drugs and alcohol and I had great insurance and so I looked at my insurance I looked at the places Orange County popped up I had no idea about the recovery industry or anything about Uh anything and so I'm like okay San Juan Capistrano um dual diagnosis this fits this fits I call up the person yeah 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 boom 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 next day all right Sean, you're leaving. You're going to uh, leave in 20 minutes, so get your stuff, and mm. you're going to get released to go get on a plane. And so my buddy shows up. This was all done behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. I didn't know when I was leaving, if I was leaving. All of a sudden, it's like, it's your time to go get your stuff. Yeah. My buddy picks me up. He's taking me to San Jose. He packed a bag for me. I don't even know if I have a toothbrush or if yeah. I got underwear or what's going on. And you were willing, right? Willing, yeah. absolutely, yeah. And again, this thing was like, okay, I'm going to do all the stuff that the doctors are saying because I got caught. Yeah. I'm here. Yeah, yeah. Th- to me, it's the same as jail. Yeah. I'm in the care of somebody, and I mm-hmm. can't leave until I jump through these hoops. Yeah. Um, Because there's still no s- salvation or solution for my problems. I'm mm-hmm. still looking at prison time. I'm still looking at a cheating ex-wife. I'm still looking at money. Right. Like, child no way out. Child it's misery. Support yeah. System. So, like, I'll jump through the hoops, and at some point, I'll mm-hmm. do something. Yeah. So, I end up... um going to rehab and <laughs> on the ride there, like you, you take the plane, you get picked up by some random person in a minivan or whatever. Mm-hmm. And we're going to some house. It's nothing like on the internet where you see this nice resort looking place. <laughs> we go to some house in like Lake forest or something. Uh-huh. It's dark. And I don't know, you know my knowledge of cults and stuff. You know, I'm Right. Like, like what is happening? Yeah. So yeah. I text my brother and my dad. I'm like, I'll be uh, out of commission for a while, but this is my last known place. Mm-hmm. Mark it on your map. And I got to turn in my phone and all that stuff. And so I did, um, I did a year, what was it? It was nine months in house. Mm. And then I got out and I did another six months uh, through Zoom. And this was right in the midst of COVID. Um, but the first thing that we did, um, aside from take a bunch of detox meds and, and yeah. you know, you know um, recalibrate, we started hitting the meetings, um, mm-hmm. the AA meetings. It was like, three a day, four a day, plus yeah. meetings that we had at the house, plus mm-hmm. therapists. And my rehab experience was the most amazing experience I've ever had in my life. I love that. And nobody gets to break away from their life to recalibrate, let alone break away from a dysfunctional pattern life mm-hmm. that has you imprisoned Yeah, because you can't stop drinking because you're going to go into withdrawals. Right. And you're, that you don't stop cycle. and think about that. You're just your yeah. body's shaking and it's like, I yeah, need something now. Yeah. And, and the people you're around probably don't know any of the mm-hmm. answers. They're just like you, they, mm-hmm. they don't know. Um, and maybe you're lucky you do have some people that know, but, um, for me, I didn't have anybody that really knew. Mm-hmm. We just had the word alcoholic and that's it. Mm-hmm. And an no alcoholic is, is bad. Yeah. Alcoholics are losers, <clears throat> you know? And yeah. then, um, but when I went to the AA meeting, I went into a group of people that was the most surreal church experience I've ever had with mm. all my church experience. Yeah. It was like God was in that room. People mm-hmm. were sharing their story, whether it was God or just good human hearts. Mm. Um, I felt at home Yeah, and I felt like this is where I belong. These mm-hmm. people are the same as me. I'm not like a bad apple or just a loser. I'm somebody who's different from normal people and I'm an alcoholic. Yeah. And I have to own that and I have to know what that means. And I have to understand that my body and brain and biology is different Mm -hmm. than a bunch of other people. That's all. Yeah. 
And, um, and that surrender, right. And willingness and identifying as that I'm sure was just a freeing experience. And then seeing all these people, I mean, it was for me too, that were relatable, you know, and you find that connection in that community. After I got into that room Mm -hmm. and I experienced that, I got home and I got down on my face and my, Mm. on my stomach, not, not for anybody. This is like, it's just me telling you that was my way of submitting. It's Mm. like, here I am. Yeah. If you're there. Everybody's saying I survived because God has a plan. Here I am. Mm-hmm. I'm going to open my eyes. Here they are. Open them. Here mm-hmm. they are. Here's my ears. Yeah. Let me see. Let me hear. Here I, you got my attention. I'm going to listen. I'm going to give you my full undivided attention. Mm-hmm. Let's go. And I swear on everything that I am today. From that point on, I've been taken care of. I've wow. never been hungry. I've never been cold. I've had many moments I did not know what was going to happen the next day. I didn't know if I was going to have a place. I didn't have a car. I didn't have a home. I didn't have a job. I didn't, but I've never gone without. It's always been there. And when I made a plan to do something and it crumbled, I turn around, there's a bigger, better, more beautiful Mm. plan on the horizon with my name on it, customized to me. And that's just because I, my heart is always to this day, show me here I am. What I learned on my journey, I, I learned so much, but number one, I rebuilt from nothing mm-hmm. like every, I, everything imploded. It was all devastated and destroyed. So I started to piece by piece restructure my life from the inside out. Right. And I think that's the key thing from the inside yeah. out. Who am I? What do I want? Yeah. What, what what's my purpose? Right. Why am I here? Mm-hmm. Did I really survive? Was that a miracle? Like, and at some point you have to just make a decision. You can't keep arguing for the rest of your life. All those things you have to just choose. Mm. And I, I pray and I hope that people choose there's a purpose because that's the first thing you have to say. There is a purpose. Yeah. That, that way the next question can be, what is my purpose? And when you start to ask that question, mm. you'll start to get the answer. But if you don't ask that question because you don't make that decision in the very beginning saying, I'm going to believe. We, we all have to believe in something. Right. We don't know if the sun's going to come up tomorrow. We believe and we hope. Mm-hmm. And we have a lot of information telling us it's going to, but we honestly... Don't know if our breath is going to stop in yeah. our body or not. And what did that purpose look like for you when you started to heal? Well, that, that was good um, because I had that question up until uh, recently. And so I wasn't quite sure what the purpose was. I just knew that love was the way mm-hmm. and to love people with a good heart and to understand that everybody is a reflection of me. Yeah. And that person in that situation... Um, is the same as me, you know, it's not different. Um, so I need to have grace. I need to have mercy and I need to just love people Mm -hmm. and, and help them in whatever way I can. Um, I don't know if that sounds like lame or whatever. No, it sounds perfect. (laughs) So basically I just, I I really try to let love guide Guide my actions and I'm a human. So I still get pissed off when people cut me off or I feel like somebody's looking at me, (laughs) you know, but I'm always like, I mean, I've structured my life in a way where pretty much the only environment I'm in, I'm helping and loving people, whether Mm. it's teaching kids, whether it's teaching adults, whether it's just being with my wife or or my son and loving them. But I, I, even when I'm doing martial arts, it's like I'm operating with, with love and compassion. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Everything you said makes sense. Um, I feel like if you lead with your heart and you lead with that purpose, everything works out. I mean, I had the same story too, which I think a lot of people do when they get into recovery and actually do the work and they completely surrender to this and to their new life. Like everything does start to fall into place because it's God's plan and there's a much bigger plan going on. And once we have the willingness to like turn over that control that we try to have and let life happen, but if we're doing it in the right way, finally, then things work out, you know, but from you know everything you've said, you've had this very traumatic life and all these series of events, and once you actually surrendered and did the work, now your life is beautiful. You know, like beyond your wildest dreams, I'm sure, right? And that's just amazing, and you're able to share that with so many people. So you train people on a regular basis, and you're now also wanting to help people that you know have gone through similar situations and that are in recovery, and maybe. You know, they want to learn, you know, through you martial arts and so many things that you get back from martial arts. Like what did martial arts teach you that you needed? Well, martial arts gave me a space uh, to work on myself. Mm. Number one, it gave me structure. Um, it, 
it, it's something I'm passionate about. It's healthy. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the vehicle of martial arts or as, as a system, regardless of what style you train in, um, it's, it's all sharpening yourself, making yourself better, making yourself stronger, um, meditation, breathing, physical exercise, self-defense, confidence, self-control, patience, humility, all those mm-hmm. things are like religions work hard to like implement those things into people's lives. Yeah. Martial arts, it's built in. Mm-hmm. Not that it's not in religion, but for me, it, it's streamlined and it, there's no garbage in there. Yeah. You know, like if, if there is garbage, we're talking, okay, that technique doesn't work. So maybe that's garbage. But as a tool for my personal growth and development, mm-hmm. it's not somebody's opinion. It's not, this is all me. I get to work and I get to progress and I get to um, refine myself. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. Work in progress. Yeah. Right? So all this stuff happened, uh, came to the, the pinnacle or, you know, came to the whatever I'm trying to say here came to a point uh <laughs> four years ago January 3rd mm-hmm. so I came down here I was I did the whole program and I was so fortunate in the recovery I was able to have access to l- a lot of different styles of therapy mm-hmm. a lot of different styles of cognitive behavioral therapy I got to learn and have access to lots of different uh, hobbies and activities mm-hmm. which are crucial in when you rebuild your life yeah so as I was rebuilding <clears throat> okay I'm getting rid of drinking I'm getting rid of um, dysfunctional relationships I'm getting rid of these types of environments I'm getting rid of this type of music or um, material that I consume mentally spiritually emotionally what do I like well I love martial arts I've been doing that since I was 16 I'm good at it mm-hmm. I, I've taught it so um, as I got out of recovery, for myself, I stayed in the recovery business to mm-hmm. help others and to lead by example and to have some safeguards there to keep me on the path yeah. with the training wheels on. And mm-hmm. so I operated as a um, uh, sober living house manager okay. for probably nice. a year and a half, I think. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I, I started working at a recovery center, a couple different recovery centers, and I was a behavioral health technician mm-hmm. at night. I'd give the meds at night, make sure everybody was safe, check their their um, vitals throughout uh-huh. the night wake them up, give them their meds. And then we would do a, a, a one hour meditation. Mm. And so that's where I really got to implement my martial art background and my yeah. breathing and yoga and all that type of physical stuff that I do into the recovery because these guys were getting groups all day long mm-hmm. facilitated by staff and therapists and um, volunteers to take them well watching to talk about their child trauma and this and that. But one yeah. thing that they all loved and told me about was they love my groups. Mm-hmm. So the groups we would do, I would teach them a different ways of meditation. You know, there's a million different ways to do it. Yeah. Um, and we would try some of them. We'd do a little of this type, a little of this type. We would read the big book. We would talk about, you know, what, what the authors were talking about and specifically in regards to meditation or, or prayer. Yeah. And then we would do med- we'd do the meditation for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, sometimes prayer. I would teach them how to pray. It wasn't a specific doctrine I was teaching. It was just verbalizing yeah. and sharing. And to, mm-hmm. to me, it's like, there's two types of prayer. There's prayer where you're doing the talking and then meditation and you're doing the listening. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I started implementing like some Tai Chi or Qigong or some s- slower karate or Taekwondo type um, movements and forms mm-hmm. uh, in unity with the breathing. And I saw people loved it. And uh, that was happening. And then all of a sudden I had an opportunity to teach Taekwondo in Huntington Beach, which I've been there for three years and then uh, I got a, an opportunity to teach kickboxing at a fitness kickboxing CKO over in uh, Foothill Ranch, mm-hmm. Lake Forest. Um, and so I got out of the recovery industry, mm. but I saw how powerful it touched people's lives. Mm-hmm. Um, these guys had never had anybody show them these things in their life. Yeah. And, and if they did, maybe it was done in a way that they just didn't receive it. But I saw people's lives changed mm-hmm. with the meditation, the prayer, the movement. And mm-hmm. so... Um, Part of what I'm doing now is I'm, I, in addition to teaching Taekwondo, I got 150 students. I teach um, kickboxing, fitness kickboxing. I've got like 40 students that specifically come to my classes. I teach uh, private lessons. But I want to get into the recovery industry, into the houses, because I know that they have needs for massage therapists. They have needs for personal trainers. They've got needs for people who take them out on boats for well watching or whatever, horseback riding, mm-hmm. um, activities that they can learn to replace some of the other activities they were doing, or if they just need some structure. Um, I'm hoping to get into that, um, where I can show up, 
talk about meditation, talk about breathing, talk about um, some fitness, maybe yeah. do some kickboxing drills, maybe do some um, slow Tai Chi type movements. Yeah. But just give them the exposure to something that is so powerful that I see transform people's lives daily. Yeah. You guys are not left behind. You guys are not going to be left to just go find that on your own. Let me be right. an ambassador and show you yeah. what it, this can do for you. And you're definitely being called to that. Like God is calling you to that. I feel like that is your ultimate purpose, being able to help people that are in recovery that, you know, have gone through similar situations. And you're your voice and your life is such a gift to other people and to be able to then show them these things to help improve their lives will be amazing. And I definitely see you doing it. And as soon as my place is open, I am going to have you there. And I think every treatment center out there should hire you. Um, that you should be doing this on a full-time basis. That, Thank you. that is, I mean, I can see it in you. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. Um, how can people get a hold of you now if they want to learn more about what you're doing, talk to you and possibly book you? Okay. Well, I've been on the Instagram for a minute. So, um, uh, my, my name on there is beast man underscore Anderson. Um, and so you can, I showcase pretty much everything I do on there and it's okay. just fun. I always put up videos and then, uh, the website, my wife and I just got going. It's called live your beast I love that. And so on there is a, uh, a form you can fill out and it'll, it'll reach out to me directly, but feel free to reach out to me or DM me through the Instagram beastman underscore Anderson, or reach out through that website, live your And I'm looking forward to helping people. That's it. Yeah. You know, I worked very hard to get right mm -hmm. <laughs> financially. Uh, you, and by the way, all those things, all. all those yeah. things that I thought were the end of the world, like mm -hmm. three different Godzilla's ready to smash me. The, um, the court took a look at that situation and they got rid of it. And so all that money that I had paid for that got credited to the account. And now I went from owing like $60,000 to now I don't owe anything. Amazing. And that's huge because that was huge. debt. And that yeah. was bankruptcy. And, and yeah. also the, um, I completed three years probation. I took a plea deal and I, I, um, I took accountability for my actions and I don't associate um, with any, anybody at all uh, in in a toxic situation. Yeah, I just got married uh, November 11th. Congratulations! Thank you. And <laughs> this human being is like the most amazing person I've been looking for in my entire life, hmm. and I've never felt that way. Wow. Um, I just fig I, I figured everybody has their issues, and you just got to suck it up, and yeah. you know. But uh, my wife is freaking amazing. So, I and then my that. son's living down here with us, and so amazing. I'm just teaching full time and loving and just living life. Yeah. And, and I just want to help others. That's and just it. shows everything you've been through, like happiness is possible. Peace of mind is possible. It is. True love is possible. You and know? I would have never, here's the, here's the kicker. I'll end with this. Yeah. When I, when things were dark and I thought there was no way out, mm -hmm. I, I was convinced mm -hmm. I'm pretty smart. Like I can figure things out. I've been on my own since I was a kid and I didn't think there was a way out. And it just goes to show you when you think there's no way out, there could be something that blows your most amazing dream out of the water. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just so thankful every single day, every moment I'm thankful. Yeah. I just live in a constant state of thankfulness. I love that. Well, thank you for being here and thank you for sharing your crazy, amazing, beautiful, profound story. I mean, it's, it's a lot that you've been through. I do think it should be a movie. Someone should write. A we life are in story the process of writing a book. My wife is an author. <laughs> okay, well there you go. And then uh, we want to do public speaking. It's, okay, that's what we're gearing up towards. So I want to yeah. open some schools. Um, she's working on some more books, and then we just want to share this message and travel and and help others. And I appreciate you bringing me onto the platform. Of course, you guys hit him up if you want to talk to him. He's a great guy. So thank you so much for being here. Thank All you. right, we'll see you later. Peace.